afternoon, everyone. I'm very glad to introduce our speaker today, Professor Debroy from Pennsylvania State University, who is here in Cambridge on the Royal Society Visiting Fellowship. Um, um, as you may know, Debroy and Harry has a well-established collaboration. Um, not only they published several review papers together, but also they together founded the journal Welding um, Science and Technology of Welding and Joining, uh, and which is the top journal in this field. I'm very glad to say that because me myself also have a paper on that. <laughs> um, um, Debroy and his team um, work on um, develop. Um, the, mo the computer models of um, heat and mass transfer, heat and mass transfer, and also um, the flow of fluid. Um, they also works on trying to to improve the reliability of the models and try to broaden the application of the models to make it more useful to the practical engineering. I shall now hand over the stage to Professor Dabroy. Thank you. I had a very good friend, and now as a result of <clears throat> this year's visit, I met many more. So I'm very pleased to be here among friends, and this is a very unique setup that <clears throat> we have a group seminar. There are very few groups as big as this to have a seminar on its own. So <clears throat> uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about what I mean by basic models, and then focus most of my talk on heat transfer and fluid flow. And finally, I'm going to be talking about how we can actually decide what we want and tell the models to give us options as to how we can get there. Right? So this is say tailoring well geometry, but it could very well say tailoring well structure or tailoring well properties. So that's what I have in mind. So basic to me is important. That's what I mean by basic. And so models, the essential physical processes, essential here is important. So what is important? Heat transfer and melting for the welding, this is the heat source, uh, this is the liquid weld pool, this is fusion welding. <clears throat> because the temperatures are high, we are going to lose some alloying elements, we are going to have absorption of nitrogen, hydrogen, oxygen. The liquid metal will flow more about that later and there is going to be liquid metal solidifying, structures developing and most important properties. So, when we talk about a theory, for an engineer in search of a theory, the simpler the better. Who said that? A graduate of Cambridge University and Professor D. E. Brian Spalding is a leading uh, fluid dynamicist and he is sometimes credited in developing the modern algorithm for heat transfer and fluid flow. Mm -hmm. So, what is simple and very good? Rosenthal model, because it's used by a lot of people, it solves heat conduction equations in three dimensions. And what can it give us? Temperature fields, fusion boundary, cooling rates, all are important. <clears throat> and it's analytical. So you do it only once and you get the final answer right away. It's very widely used, it's simple, it's phenomenological because it considers its conduction and it's insightful. But it does not consider convection, which is the main mechanism of heat transfer in many cases. Right? And so all is not well. So there are four more difficulties I want to point out. And where I'm coming from is a quote from Albert Einstein who said everything should be made as simple as possible but not simpler. So what is simple and what is not simpler? Look at the world of welding and I bet most of you can recognize 
which one came from which process. This is the most common hemispherical well. But then, uh, someone like Singh Ko, who likes to do a lot of experiments, found that if you weld NaNO3 with a spot laser, you get a shape like this. Just the opposite is when you weld mild steel under certain arc welding conditions. You look at the friction star weld, and this is very common, very high power density weld, it's like this, hybrid weld, arc and laser combined, you get a shape that is very special, this talking second bracket. So, if you try to use Rosenthal equation to predict all of those, everything will look like this. So I've got a hammer and I think the entire world is nails. That's what you'll find. Second problem is, not everyone does welding in the laboratory. And real materials are sometimes on a particular component which is tilted. And then it is the heat and fluid flow that gives you the shape and you get a very different shape if you have a L-shaped weld versus a V-shaped weld. And this cannot be predicted by heat conduction model. You throw in a little bit of sulfur, selenium, tellurium, in steel elements that have a propensity to go to the surface because they have they are systems that are characterized by very large negative enthalpy of segregation. And for those elements, the shape can be very different when you throw in a little bit of sulfur more than here. But it doesn't always happen. This is also of the same composition. If you have a smaller power laser, you will not see this effect. So two people repeating many times an experiment of this type will discover this effect, but they don't know why that is so. Sometimes alpha does it, other times there is no effect of sulfur. So why does it happen? Rosenthal equation is not the place to go. And my good friend Harry, I'm quoting from him, I hope not out of context, but here is some data to support that aspect ratio versus ratio of cooling rate from proposed correlation. This is something we developed versus experimental cooling rate or cooling rate from heat conduction model divided by experimental cooling rate. This ratio should be one if the experimental cooling rate is same as cooling rate from heat conduction model. So all these points should be here, but they are all 13 or 17 times higher. Why is that? Why is the heat conduction equation predicting a cooling rate that is more than 10 times higher than experimentally determined? Very simple. It doesn't allow mixing of the hot and cold fluids. When hot and cold fluids are mixed, the temperature gradient decreases and cooling rate is nothing other than temperature gradient times the welding velocity and that is why Rosenthal equation will always predict even under the best of conditions a higher cooling rate. Now you might say I am a steel metallurgist all I care about is very far away from weld pool where there is no liquid to mix, so I am home free to use it. Yeah? Be very careful because what you are doing is your temperature gradients are wrong within the wet pool and therefore the flux that is going outside is wrong and it is the flux that will tell you what the 800 to 500 cooling time is going to be. So don't count on it. All right, don't count on it. So, uh, Spencer, Greenhoff, and uh, Harry, uh, they recommended empirical correlations. And those correlations are available in STWJ. Uh, convective heat transfer calculations do not suffer from the four problems that I mentioned. So, what can they do? 
they have diverse applications. I want to bring to your attention a selected few. All right. So to start with, um, what sort of flow we are talking about? You know, yeah, there is a heat source which is impinging here. And therefore, the temperature would be maximum in this place. And right at the edge of this pool, I'm showing only half of the wet pool, you will have solid liquid equilibrium temperature or close to that. So maybe solidus temperature and a little bit farther away, liquidus temperature very close by. And because there is a temperature gradient, there is also a spatial gradient of interfacial tension. Spatial gradient of interfacial tension is a stress, known as Marangoni stress. And it is because of this stress that the liquid is shooting from right about the highest temperature to everywhere else. And what are these two circulation patterns? This is arc welding. So there is an electromagnetic force field. And because of that, there are two other loops apart from this loop and that loop. So the well pool is very well mixed. What does it mean? If I throw in a little bit of consumable, it won't take very long for the consumable to be mixed well with the rest of the liquid metal. Yeah? That's good or bad? That's excellent. Yeah? So, uh, diverse applications. What are the diverse applications? Different processes you can do. The main engine will be the same. Transient three-dimensional heat mass and momentum transfer equations, otherwise known as Navier-Stokes equation and energy equation. That's what would be solved by the main engine. And many, many times, okay, numerous times, and you will get solidification parameters, growth rates, temperature gradients, transient temperature velocity fields, mixing of consumables, heating, cooling rates. I can keep reading for a while as to what it can do. And there are numerous applications, just literally numerous. So um, I, I think uh, instead of my reading all of these, um, I, uh, let me give you some examples so that you don't have to read a big list of stuff. Okay? So understanding unusual with function. Unusual here is not hemispherical. So let me show you. This is hemispherical. But let's say that I have this sodium nitrate. And just for fun, one Saturday afternoon, Harry comes in and turns in a very tiny, small laser beam. This is what he's going to get. This is from Signal Coast work. And we simulated that laser melting of sodium nitrate. And here, this is arc welding of steel. This is uh, a, a picture we took from STWJ. So what makes the shape so different? There is no keyhole here. There is no friction star welding. There is no high intensity laser beam. And even there, we can get such unusual So there, are, there is one criteria for the deflection of this, of this shape. That is called Marangoni number. And Marangoni number, in short, is a representation of how strong the Marangoni force is. So if there is a very strong temperature gradient on the surface, the Marangoni number will be very large. How large? Typically, if you exceed 30,000, you will start having these inflections. And depending on what your other parameters are, and in this particular case, parental number, Cp mu by K specific heat times viscosity by thermal conductivity, you will either get a convex bottom or a concave bottom. And then if your Marangoni number is lower, you will always get Rosenthal type hemispherical pool. And if your parental number is very high, metals have low parental numbers. Non-metals have high parental numbers. 
So sodium nitrate will create this W type profile. All right. Why is that? In simple terms, it is the interaction of all these forces that are represented by surface tension force, viscous force, and the ratio of viscous diffusion rate to thermal diffusion rate. All right. Surface profiles are very important for properties. So, what sort of profiles are we talking about? If we are adding consumables, there are four dimensions. This elevation, this length, that length, and the angle theta. These four dimensions actually control the fatigue properties of wells. And therefore, these are very important. And that is what is shown in this diagram schematically. Two angle and the three geometric dimensions. How can you, how can the heat and fluid flow calculation help? Um, you see, as the uh, heat source moves, the liquid is pushed behind, and eventually, when the heat source is farther away, it solidifies. So uh, we are after this angle. Because this angle is the most single most important factor. How so? Let's take a look at these three. And of these three, if you look at this angle, this is much more gradual than that one. So this well is not as good as that one. All right? Ideally, I would like everything to be smooth, but if I'm adding consumer rules, that may not be the case. So we have to be concerned about all of these four dimensions that are shown in the blue color here, and the model can actually predict all of those. Um, can you read this stuff, or should we lower the? Yes, yes, you can. Yeah. Can you can you read this, or should we lower yeah. the light a little bit? Okay, great. Thank you. Surface active elements. Remember what those are. Elements that love to go to the surface because they reduce the total energy of the system by doing so. Yeah? And typically, in terms of the free energy, it is the enthalpy contribution. So large excess negative enthalpy of segregation. That's the type of elements we are talking about. What are those? Sulfur, oxygen, nitrogen, selenium, tellurium, lot of them. In, in schemes. All right, so what happens is that if you have a pure element such as iron, the interfacial tension decreases with increasing temperature. But if you throw in one of those elements that like to go to surface, the interfacial tension first increases and then decreases. So how is that important in welding? Well, Marangoni stress is the spatial variation of interfacial tension, which can be decomposed into a physical property, how surface tension changes with temperature, slope of these plots, times the temperature gradient that is present on the surface of the well. DTDX is how temperature varies on the surface. Temperature is high right under the heat source and relatively low near the solid liquid interface compared to the middle. So this term is always negative. That one depends on whether you have sulfur or whether it's pure metal. So if you take that number, this, is, this can be negative or positive. You can see that here. And this is always negative. So the stress, which is the, uh, the tau here, can be either negative or positive. And that means if the stress is positive, the liquid metal will pick up heat here and go sideways. It will melt the sideways, and it will be a shallow and uh, wide pool, as opposed to when you are picking up heat here, going downwards, as if this is like a thermal drill, Heat is picked up by the liquid metal, which goes downward. So you get a deeper pool and a narrower pool. All right? So if you do a calculation, you can actually show that. 
in this particular case, very little sulfur, so this behaves almost like a pure metal, in which case the stress is that way, so heat is transported from this point by the liquid metal that is flowing radially outward to this point, so it is melting sideways and it doesn't melt so much except for heat conduction. In this case, in contrast, the flow is shown by this red arrow, it is just the opposite of that one. So heat is conducted downward, so you get a much deeper pool and a much somewhat narrower pool. So the contrast is very visible. But you now lower the power of the laser. This is 5200, 5.2 kilowatt. And uh, this particular one, picklet number greater than uh, 80, picklet number is the ratio of heat transported by convection and the heat transported by conduction. So a picklet number much higher than one simply means that most of the heat is transported by convection. So if you do not take fluid flow into account in these cases, then you are ignoring the main mechanism of heat transfer, and that is not good. All right? So let's see what happens when convection is not important, when picklet number is much lower. When would that be? when the velocities are very small and when can you have velocities that are very small when the temperature gradient is small here the temperature gradient in all this length is of the order of about 100 degree Kelvin that is not a very high temperature gradient and therefore the velocities are much lower than what we had in the previous case so the convection currents are in the opposite direction, but convection is not the main mechanism of heat transfer, and therefore nothing happens. You can very easily use Rosenthal equation, and that would be a very smart thing to do because you don't have to use the numerical code. You will uh, be done much quicker and your results will be as accurate as the numerical model. So here is one case where uh, heat conduction equation will do splendidly. Somebody having a 2 kilowatt laser doing experiments under these condi conditions would have a conclusion that small changes in composition is not important. All right? Although, Ideally, all of you should think of qualifying that. Just saying, it's not important in this case because heat conduction is the main mechanism of heat transfer. If convection were the main mechanism of heat transfer, then I could not, I would see a, a definitive impact. Okay. There are also other cases. So here, if you are only doing experiments, you will not know why this is happening. You will know this is happening. But if you also do modeling, okay, in addition to experiments, not in lieu of, then of course you will know when that happens. And that is important. All right. Now, let's take two different plates. One having no sulfur, the other one having high sulfur. And what is low and what is high? I'll tell you. Uh, 0.293 weight percent sulfur is pretty high. 0 0.003 weight percent sulfur is pretty low. And this is the interface. But every time you do the welding, what you will find is that it doesn't melt the high sulfur part, it melts only the low sulfur part. Although you put the arc right above this. All right. So this is a very different effect than what we have been discussing. But this is not a, an isolated example. This happens all the time. So how come? Any clue? 
all right, I didn't have any clue either. I didn't know. But these experiments were done at Los Alamos. And these, these folks have everything instrumented. They record everything for security reasons, if not for anything else. So there was this camera recording everything, including the arc. And what we found is that any time you do this type of an experiment, the arc shifts. Yeah? So the question then was, why is the arc shifting? And uh, the features are not very clearly visible, but the tracks here in the low sulfur case, this is melting more than that one. And uh, the top surface really doesn't show it. This surface very clearly shows that it's the low sulfur part where you have most of the melting. So we wanted to see if this is because of a sulfur, potential sulfur gradient. Yeah? Because for some reason, there can be a fluid flow in one direction and temperature effect. Maybe we are losing the sulfur, maybe sulfur is doing something funny. So we wanted to check it out. And we froze some wells and then we took a uh, <coughs> concentration plot right in the middle here and uh, along this direction and we find that it is exactly what is what it is supposed to be that means on low sulfur on one end and high sulfur on another case and vertically there is no gradient on the on the z axis is the vertical axis so it's it cannot be conveniently explained by some kind of strange segregation of sulfur it is not that and we finally decided that, well, this effect is for real. So then the question was, why is that happening? And the true answer is, we still do not know today. But one possibility is that the sulfur covers more surf surface on high sulfur side and less uh, metal sites on the surface. So in terms of evaporation of metals, more metals evaporate on the lower sulfur side. And you know what that means? When you feed metal vapors into an arc, you create a path of very low resistance. So the arc likes metal vapors because it can pass currents very easily. Arc doesn't like non-conducting media. So that is one possibility, that sulfur is blocking up these sites. The low sulfur sites are giving up metal vapors. And these metal vapors are inviting the arc towards their site. And that is why this is happening. But this is right now a, an unproven theory. I am not saying I need the answer. And that's why I was asking. If you have some thoughts, this is an area because you need always wear this. Uh, how do we incorporate this shift in the model? Semi empirically, we find the extent of shift. This is what we call shift, the point where the maximum penetration occurs and the interface between the high and the low sulfur. And we plot this shift as a function of heat input and concentration difference. And therefore, these are the two factors, heat input and difference in concentration. And we draw a linear plot through that. And uh, therefore, we know where the arc is. And once we know where the arc is, we do the modeling just like any other case. And when we do that, we can explain this type of a behavior. All right? In other words, we are not s s saying that we know phenomenal logically what exactly is happening. But we are saying that this theory is consistent with the pool shapes and all the experimental observations that we have at the moment. So this is tentative. Uphill, downhill, tilt, L and V configurations. 
this time. All right? We can do it in very different ways, and the shapes will be different. And all these have been done. They're all available in the literature. Um, uh, it could be uphill welding like this, or downhill welding like this, or it could be tilt angle can be zero. And all of these can be predicted. There are comparisons with theory and experiments, and all of these can be explained using convective heat transfer. Composition change is another very critical factor. What sort of composition change? You know, the temperatures can be very high in laser welding or electron beam welding, where the power densities are very high. How high? pretty close to the boiling point of the alloy, where the sum total of all vapor pressures add up to ambient pressure. Right? In case of steels, very close to about 3000 degree Kelvin. And in those cases, if you take a USS Penelon, which is shown by this triangle, that contains about 15.5 weight percent manganese, you can have a pretty healthy loss of in other cases, in AISI 201 and 202, that contains 6 to 7 percent manganese, the loss is very pronounced, although not as high as that of NLO, but uh, they could be of concern. But same thing happens when you try to weld 6,000 series aluminum alloys because these are solid solution strengthening alloys containing magnesium and magnesium is selectively vaporized because its vapor pressure over liquid alloy is much higher than the vapor pressure of aluminum which is the solvent at that temperature. So you selectively lose the strengthening agent. So the well, material, when it solidifies, does not have the solid solution effect to the extent that it had in the parent metals. So that's a problem. These are autogenous wells, right? These are autogenous wells. So one possibility is that you add, um, you know, consumables that compensate for that loss. And the models will allow you to do that. Um, Composition change, ironically, is more pronounced at lower powers. Can you guess why? The important factors here are temperature, volume of the metal from which the elements are coming from, or the surface to volume ratio, and the temperature. Right? In a small pool, the surface to volume ratio will be larger and the larger pool because the volume is R cube, right? Surfaces are square. So what happens is in a smaller pool, all of the alloying elements come from a very small region. So the uh, composition chain becomes very, very pronounced. And it's kind of ironic, but it's it's more important for um, micro joining. If you have a volatile component in an alloy, then in micro welding, this can be very pronounced. So we did some experiments in which we, uh, we put a quartz tube, we collected some papers, and we said the relative rates of vaporization of A and B would be a function of temperature. And the relative rates of A and B, vaporization of A and B, can be determined experimentally very easily by analyzing the condensate. Right? So you do an experiment, or do maybe 10 experiments, collect really healthy amount of deposit, and send them out for analysis for various experiments, and you will get the relative rates of vaporization of various alloys very accurately. And uh, it's possible to obtain temperatures from such experiments. Yeah. Because think of somebody doing micro joining experiments, doing experiments for milliseconds. How are you going to determine temperature? Parameters? 
So chemical processes can give out a lot. And here is an example. I'm plotting flux of iron to manganese as a function of temperature. This is the theoretical curve plotted by this because we know the molecular weights and we know the equilibrium partial pressures of A and B, which are any two components, in this case iron and manganese, which is plotted here as a function of temperature. And if the uh, laboratory is telling me that this ratio is 10.8, I can resolve the peak temperature from this scale. Why peak temperature? Because vapors are coming from all over the whirlpool. Not why. Vapors are coming from the most uh, high temperature region. Because the vapor pressure is a very steep function of temperature. It increases very steeply the temperature. So you pretty much get the peak temperature by this technique. And you can, of course, determine peak temperature from numerical heat transfer and fluid flow. And if you do that, you will get accuracies that are comparable to any measurement accuracies of the measurement of this type of temperatures. All right? The accuracy is nothing to write home about, but um, you know, if you are measuring 3000 degree Kelvin temperatures and you've got a few milliseconds to do it, this is a pretty good deal. Uh, you can check whether the, uh, the heat and fluid flow model is giving you reasonable results by various ways. And these are pretty small sub millimeter wells. As you can see, this is one millimeter here. But the shapes agree reasonably well with experimental results. And the uh, paper compositions also agree with what you can calculate theoretically. Because you have the temperature fields on the surface and everywhere else. So in principle, you should be able to calculate from a vaporization model, which is a big task that can be done. A lot of people do such calculations. And, uh, in micro welding, there are some funny effects. Like if you lose uh, manganese and chromium, in this case, this is 18% chromium, 1% manganese, 8% nickel, and the balance is iron, pretty much, very low carbon. So for this type of steel, this is a plain grinder stainless steel, it, it, it will actually get loss of chromium and a little bit of manganese and the other two will actually go up by a small weight percent because we are losing the two other valuable elements. And the composition change is something that you can experimentally verify by uh, drawing a microprobe trace. And uh, here are uh, the traces for manganese and for chromium and you can see that uh, the manganese content is certainly lower than what was in the base metal. And similarly here, the chromium content of the wave pool is lower than that in the base metal. So, this theory can be very hard experimental. Uh, if you draw distance versus temperature plots for different times, then uh, this is a 3 millisecond pulse at about 1 kilowatt with a small centimeter beam, uh, what will happen is sometimes there will be recoil force falling on the surface. You know why? It's like a jet plane. You take out a lot of gases and uh, it will provide a thrust. So similarly, this thrust of the vaporizing uh, atoms we push the liquid down. So what keeps the liquid within this hemisphere is the surface tension force. So if you keep increasing this power density, there will come a time when the required force will be simply too much for the 
surface tension force to contain the liquid within the molten pool and boom at that point uh, you will start throwing out particles and that's bad news because if you are micro joining the last thing you want is a crater in your micro joint so this is bad so we wanted to characterize this and, and this does happen like this is a droplet we collected in the quartz tube so clearly sometimes this does happen so we wanted to do this so we, we said okay we'll calculate the deformation of the free surface because of the backward thrust of the vapors that are coming out and we found that when this length became significantly large compared to the depth uh, and uh, it's this ratio L by D ratio when it exceeded that there was expulsion of the, uh, of the droplets so we could create process maps in which we plotted spot diameter versus laser power and this is our demarcation line predicted by theory that if you cross this demarcation line you can have heavy expulsion of uh, droplets and these were again confirmed by experiments these are all experimental data points so you can create safe operating regimes using models okay? and reduce the rejection rate for micro joints uh, power density versus pulse duration because sometimes that is a variable too and these blue dots, solid dots are unacceptable and this is what is predicted by theory so below that we will have evaporation but no significant expulsion of liquid droplets and this is good, that is bad um, gas dissolution nitrogen, hydrogen, oxygen, stuff like that we are caught in undergraduate classes that any time you are having a diatomic gas it obeys what we call Siebert's law which is simply like half N2 gas giving you 2N or half N2 gas giving you nitrogen dissolved in iron right? so you write an equilibrium constant which is equal to activity of nitrogen by P into the power half so the concentration of nitrogen is proportional to P diatomic gas to the power half. That linearity, concentration versus square root of partial pressure of the diatomic gas, is Siebert's law. And that is one thing that does not apply for welding. Look at the welding of, this is uh, arc melting or arc welding of nickel, and the nitrogen concentration is way higher than predicted by Siebert's law and you can say well your model has got temperature wrong maybe so but you change the temperature to your heart's content you will never get there all right so something else is happening the paradigm is different and so what is different in gas metal system Siebert's law holds good very well in glass plasma system where you have excited neutral atoms ions or molecules and atoms these neutral atoms and ions play important role in determining how much of nitrogen or oxygen or hydrogen will dissolve how do we know that from thermodynamics so what is plotted here is equilibrium solubility on the vertical axis and there are two x axes one is temperature axis the other one is pressure of the gas in this case this is diatomic gas from zero to one atmosphere and this is pressure of monatomic gas zero to one times ten million so this is actually 1 upon 10 million atmosphere very 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 low concentration of atomic hydrogen it gives you the same equilibrium concentration as one atmosphere of diatomic uh, nitrogen 
So you need 10 million times lower concentration of atomic nitrogen to give you the same concentration in the well metal compared to what you will get using one atmosphere of diatomic gas. And so it is very important to take that into account. And uh, so what we did was we did an experiment in which we generated plasma using an RF generator and by evacuating this chamber. And we, we looked at the light in terms of intensity versus wavelength that the plasma gives up. So we could characterize what is the environment of this droplet. So we are heating this droplet and we are exposing this droplet to plasma to see what happens to the gas concentration in the plasma. And this is what happens. Weight percent nitrogen by weight percent nitrogen based on Sivert's law. So it should be really one if we got dissolution taking place from diatomic gas. But it's 20 to 10 to 20 times higher. And this is because, okay, let's look at the light emission. This is the intensity versus wavelength. So what is happening here is that when the electrons change from one energy level to the other, the difference in the energy that is given up as light. And that is what we are collecting here. So these are characteristic wavelengths for atomic nitrogen. So atomic nitrogen is definitely present. And then we are getting such huge jumps in the nitrogen solubility that should not happen if Sivar's law were applicable, all right? So that's the story. Now, this can be modeled, and we have modeled this, but I, I think uh, my time is coming to an end, and I would like to tell you one other short story before I finish. So I will skip a few view graphs, all right? Uh, because it will take some time to explain this. You can theoretically calculate the plasma composition. It has been done uh, by Robert Palmer. This is from his work. Um, and uh, let's forget the tasks. There are many more applications of heat and fluid flow. You can go to our website and you'll be greeted by uh, this particular screen. If you go one or two layers down, then you'll see a lot of other applications. And, uh, so I will uh, forget this. But, let me tell you about this because we are really excited that uh, it's possible. You can go to the computer, play before the computer, okay, and it can happen. All right. So, here is the requirement. Somebody, a design engineer, provides these requirements. Someone on the floor of Caterpillar is sitting at the desk doing simulations and it's telling, okay, come up with different sets of variables that would produce this geometry, okay? So what are my options? That is the question in the computer. I want this particular shape and size and tell me how I can get there. And we can do it today. This can be done. This has been done. Okay. So how do we do that? Uh, you know, the most important variables are current, voltage, and welding speed as far as the arc welding is concerned. So you select many sets of these and you calculate with the geometry. If those geometries agree with your desired geometry, you write an objective function that would be very small. And if the geometry that is calculated by your set is not very good, then the objective function will be large. So we call this fitness function. Okay? And genetic algorithm is like survival of the fittest. So you have a, a population of maybe 100 sets of these combinations of current voltage and welding velocity. These are like 100 people, and they reproduce, they die, they 
make children, and uh, all of those have a certain fitness function. And if the fitness is good, that means they are our solution. If the fitness is not good, then uh, they eventually die off. So that's the mechanism of optimization. So here is an example. We want to form a well of this penetration and that width. Okay? We actually did an experiment and this is the well. So we want to know, other than what we used, this current voltage and welding speed, are there any other way to make this well? That's the question. Okay? Are there many other ways in which I can make that well? That's the question. All right. So we define an objective function that has to do with the depth and the width, and uh, uh, the computer goes to work. It produces fitness functions, uh, and it comes up with several um, uh, eight alternative welding conditions achieved after 15 generations. So generations are passing by, and uh, populations are becoming smarter. Like you all are smarter than your teachers. You all have better education than your teachers. And those who are teachers, please don't feel insulted. <laughs> because facts sometimes hurt. Right? Okay, so here is the here's this set of all eight of those results. Current voltage welding speed and penetrations. This is what the genetic algorithm told us. And these are the target physical experiment that we did. All right? And then what we do with these results, we take this current voltage and, uh, and welding speed and we fabricate eight welds. We go actually physically to the lab and do these eight welds to see whether they are actually what the algorithm is telling us, whether this can be trusted, all right? And these are the values. Okay, here's the summary table. These are the uh, conditions obtained by GA. This is what the GA computed. And these are the measured values, all right? So it is for you to see whether this can be done today or not. Thank you very much.
press a button and out comes all the graphs and presentations. If that is the impression I gave you, uh, that is wrong. But you have to adjust certain things. Yes. I, I think um, it's a genetic algorithm question. Yes, I fully understand that. And that's what I was meaning, that the GA that we have taken it's called parent. There are two GAs we use. One is differential algorithm, which is which came out of University of California Berkeley. Uh, the detailed um, information about that. And the other one was uh, originally proposed at IIT Kanpur in India, and uh, that is called parent-centric uh, algorithm. We use both of them. But do you have to do something to make sure the current current doesn't go to 10,000 amps or, or your physical models which the genetic algorithm calls simply mm. tells you that that's not... No, we keep uh, all our variables dimensionless between 0 and 1. So the floor and the ceiling is specified. Uh, and uh, the, the current obviously cannot be less than 0 and it cannot be more than a certain maximum that we predetermine and tell. You can view that as the capacity of your equipment. That means if there exists a solution that is imaginary, you want to avoid that. Or unrealistic is a better way. Is there any more questions? No, we just mm -hmm. discussing whether this model can take into account any phase transformation? You know, uh, I had to make a choice. I had to make a choice. The models have been used extensively for contributions in phase transformation. What I discovered was I had to give about 30 slides to talk about those applications. Uh, there is a group of people in Lawrence Livermore National Lab that do some similar type of experiments that Harry does with synchrotron. And they need um, uh, temperature time history to meaningfully convert those phase transformation kinetic data to TTT curves and then to CCT curves. That is a fascinating story. I would have loved to tell that story, but it would have added another 30 minutes of my time. There are many papers that you will find in that website that describes the application of heat and fluid flow uh, models in deciphering the synchrotron data. Friday afternoon. <laughs> Thank you.